Howdy. Uh, well, I'm starting a new series tonight called Power Struggles. You know, uh, I had a really, really, really funny joke that I wanted to share with you guys before I get started, but I forgot it, so. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> it's just so funny. Uh, yeah, I, I was trying to get um, my kids to eat this week. For those of you who have kids, you know what it means to try and get your kids to eat. So an hour and a half later, they took a nap. <laughs> Sometimes I, I kind of feel like, um, and I know I feel like this as a parent a lot of times, but I feel like I had to fight everywhere just to hold on to life. You know what I mean? Especially once you have kids, it's like it's a constant tug of war just to be able to live without chaos. A lot of kids, kids it's like they, they're drawn to chaos. I don't know. Um, and, you know, it's not just kids that you feel like that oftentimes. It's, you know, sometimes you have problems with your family or problems at work or maybe it's issue with taxes or that kind of stuff. Maybe you have different struggles. I, I don't know. But uh, surely, have, have you ever felt like you're just losing control in the situation? Kind of like maybe the kids have more leverage than you do, or whatever whatever your power struggle is with. Uh, and, and you know, you, you feel like you're, you're always fighting just to hold stuff together. Do you ever feel like that? Because uh, I felt like that this week with with, with the kids. And uh, it's it, it's funny that uh, that we should look at uh, power struggles the same week. Because I had this this idea going on for really quite a few weeks while I was still in my last series. So before Chuck's series, this was like two months ago. Um, and uh, I think that this quote by Octavia Butler kind of gets us started on a good note with what we're going to be looking at. She says, all struggles are essentially power struggles. Who will rule? Who will lead? Who will define? Who will refine, confine, and design? Who will dominate? All struggles are essentially power struggles, and most are no more intellectual than two rams knocking their heads together. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think I relate to her on a different, onto that quote on a different uh, different level, though. I feel like a ram, all right, but sometimes I feel like I'm butting heads with God. You know what I mean? Like, he wants to do his thing, and I want to do my thing. I'm like, God, you're not doing it right. So rather than just listening to God and doing what God wants us to do, sometimes we butt heads with God. You know what I mean? God, you did it wrong. You, you don't understand, God. This was how you were supposed to do it. Or, or maybe that's not your area. I don't know. Maybe for you... You feel like you're butting heads against your spouse. You know what I mean? It seems like you guys disagree about everything. Or your children. You tell them to clean their room. Five days later, it's still not clean. It's like, what's taking so long, guys? Um, or, you know, maybe it's something with work with your boss. I don't know. But for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at four very important questions that we have to answer in every power struggle. And the first important question that I want you to consider is this one. What do I control? A lot of times we just kind of assume that we're in control of something that, that we probably aren't. And then when control or the illusion of control is yanked from our hands, uh, we kind of fall apart because we're like, okay, hold on, I had that under control and now now it's just falling apart. So what do I, can I control? And, and there's two very, very quick, easy answers. Number one, my relationship with God. Number two, my grip. Okay, I'll go over that again. The two things that I control are my relationship with God and my grip. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's look at that a little bit more uh, in depth. Okay, and these uh, first we're going to look at uh, what why, what I control. Number one, my relationship with God. Four specific things about my relationship with God. First, how I listen to God. Uh, Matthew six nine through ten says this: Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Ah, that's the part that kills it. It's like, Jesus, I was, I was on board with you. You know, you're blessed if you're being persecuted. You're saying a lot of great things, God. But then you get to this, your will be done. Ah, oh. <laughs> dang it. It's, that's, 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 the, that's the proof in the pudding right there. On earth as it is in heaven. Ah, okay, God, maybe I don't have this so in control as I thought I did. And the thing is, when you say something that powerful, your will be done. That means it's even if it's something that I don't like, still your will be done. So, okay, that sounds simple, but let's look at that. What are some things that we don't like? Forgive that person. Oh, I have to forgive them? What? That's crazy, God. 
come on now. Or, you know, maybe it's maybe you don't have a problem with forgiveness, which if you if you don't have a problem with forgiveness, we, give me your number. We need to talk. I, I, I really, really need to know your secrets. But uh, maybe it's ministry. You know, maybe God's calling you to do a ministry that you really don't want to do. You know, for some people, they think of being called in the mission field, going across the seas, and they think, oh, how terrible that would be. Having to leave family in my house. And I don't know. Uh, you know, you get to travel, but then I think that the that the newness would wear off after about a year, and you realize you don't know these people's language, you don't know their culture. Uh, for some people, it's it's maybe you're called to be a pastor, and you're like, oh dear God, I don't want to do that. And we almost have like this negativity towards God, like, what if God asked me to do something I don't want to do? So therefore, I won't ask Him, and I'll just circumvent that whole issue. And it doesn't really work like that because you know God's very very persistent. He doesn't give up, and that's. Uh, sometimes a little frustrating. <laughs> or maybe it's an area that you need to serve people. You know, it, life, it, if we let it, gets very self-centered. And it feels very comfortable when it's self-centered. Um, in fact, in a lot of studies that they've done recently, um, your brain is pretty much, like, um, shapeable. But the older you get, they found that your brain starts to harden. And what that means for you is that it becomes harder to change your ways. It became, becomes harder to learn stuff because your brain isn't as flexible as it was when you, when you were a kid. There's ways around it. I'm not saying you're doomed to be the same person now as you are. I'm, I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying that that is the reality of the situation. Um, or maybe maybe you're like me. You're kind of a, uh, they call them um, introverts. I, I, guys, I, going outside is like a vampire going into the sun. Like, ah! People will see me and they'll want to talk to me. God, then they'll start to know me. God, don't let people know me. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, so maybe for you, maybe it's something a little bit more personal. Maybe you just have a hard time inviting people into your world, into, into, your, into the church, into, you know, into fellowship, into, you know, maybe even it's just something as simple as, hey, you know, can I pray for you? Maybe something even that simple just gets to be this monumental number that you just can't seem to climb. Um, you know, it, it, everybody has something different. Um, maybe you just want to live different. Maybe God wants you to live different than how you want to live. <laughs> and how you naturally feel. Like, let me give you, I'm trying to think of some examples here. Like, for instance, I talk to a lot of people who look at porn, which they're kind of surprised, like, Oh, you know that I look at porn? It's like, yeah, it's all over your face. But now here's the thing that surprises me. I've been running into people lately who actually think that looking at pornography isn't wrong. This is a this is a new era for the cyber world, guys. We're running into into people who are actually proud of their uh, uh, pornography online online pornography accounts. I mean, that just opens a whole new door of uh, oh, you know, before when you talk to people about pornography, you could always lean back on the whole thing about we we all know that this is wrong. But how do you carry on a conversation about how to fix something that they don't see as a problem and say, oh. Uh, and uh, may, maybe it's not something like that. Maybe it's just talking about others. But I will say this. In every single church conflict that I've ever been in, it wasn't the people who were, you know, alcoholics who were breaking up the church. It wasn't people who were druggies. It wasn't the people who were living in pornography. It was the people who were talking about people. Talking about people is the quickest route to destroy a church. It's the quickest route to destroy anything. Um, you know, I, I read something online that really, I remember this. You remember where you were on 9-11, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody remembers where they were. Uh, I, w I remember sitting on my mom's bed. It was the world of, uh, it, it, so I think I saw it on, on, on Facebook. It said, I miss America on the 12th. You know, we were all talking about unity. You know, if, if you, we had a, they had a, a little slogan, um, united we stand, divided we fall. And that's the same kind of principle for the church, too. It, we're either united or, or, I mean, we're just a collection of people who are fighting together. You know, I mean, you can, you can sugarcoat it however you want, but that's how it comes down to. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that, that um, reflect how I'm listening to God. Um, here's another quick thing about, remember, we're talking about my relationship with God. The two things that I control. Number one, my relationship with God. Okay. So the first thing about my relationship with God, how I listen to God. But the second thing, very important as well, how I manage things. 
This would be like, for instance, how you manage your money. Sometimes we feel like our money is our own, and so we go out wasting every single penny of it, and then we can't afford our rent, and then we have to ask people for money because we weren't wise with what we had. See what I mean? And uh, I'm not trying to look down on anybody, but how we manage things, everything that we have in life is really a gift from God. And he expects us to manage it well. That kind of makes sense, right? Um, at least it doesn't here, so you know. It made sense when I was writing the sermon, you know. And I think that if you, if you stop and think about it, I think you might, you might join with me too here. Um, how we spend our time, you know, everybody has a limited amount of time in the world. Um, everybody has, you know, uh, has to get sleep. Everybody has, you know, just 24 hours in a day. Everybody has the same week that you had. Now, here's the problem, though. We don't know how long those weeks will continue. <laughs> uh, you know, you might die in your 60s. You might die in your 90s. You might die in your... I, 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 uh, there's actually a, a pastor that we kind of uh, do read some of his books and whatnot. His name's Donald Ross. His grandma just turned 103. So, who knows? You might live a long time. You might not. I don't know. But uh, how I manage my things is a reflection of my relationship with God. Because if God gives me money and I use it all on myself, then I'm a self-centered person. If God gives me time and I spend it all on myself, then I'm a self-centered person. See, God has given us something and I've done the bare minimum with it. I haven't even invested it. Making a poor investment, that's, that's fine. I mean, it, it happens. But not investing at all, that's just silly. That's just silly. Imagine you have money. So money in, in America, I don't know if you guys know anything about money. I don't know. I'm just going to assume you don't. That way we're all on the same page. Money is, in America is slowly becoming less valuable. So like, let's say you have $1. Well, in a couple of years, that $1 will be less, worth less than it is now. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. I'm really, really simplifying this a lot. So imagine I have a monstrous amount of money, and instead of investing it into any kind of a, I mean, even a simple savings account, I decided to bury it outside my backyard. Well... Unless that specific print of money becomes a collectible, chances are it's going to be worth less. So I would have done less than nothing with the money. Because I was actually throwing it away. How I manage things definitely is a reflection. How I manage my family. Am I there for, am I, am I there for my kids? Am I there for my wife? This is a trust from God. The Proverbs always talks about a wife being a, if you found a wife, you found a good thing. And I feel like a lot of times as husbands, we, we don't really contribute that much in the idea of a wife being a good thing instead of a bad thing. You know, we're, we're big on complaining about our wives. I don't feel like we're real big on appreciating them for the gift that they are. Um, or like kids. I mean, oftentimes we get caught up in the, in, you know, the stubbornness of our kids instead of realizing you know, the blessing that we got there. Um, anyways, how do we handle politics? If there's somebody who doesn't agree with us politically, are we... Do we sit there and just make fun of them and mumble under our breasts? See what I mean? The, the, how I, what I've been given is, is really a trust from God. How, my, my thoughts. Think about this. God has, has gifted us the, the, the gift of thought. But yet oftentimes we squander that gift. A third area that shows my relationship with God is how I treat people. Oh boy. I'll give you two examples of how we treat people. Now, if you just stop and think real quick, I treat people pretty well. You know, okay, well, let's look at two scripture verses that, that might, it might change how you, how you feel about yourself. The first one is in Exodus chapter 23. If you see the donkey of one who hates you, so this is your enemy here, lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. You have to go out of your way to help your enemy in a pickle that he got himself into. How I treat others shows my relationship with God. If I'm quick to forgive, it shows that I'm growing in my relationship with God. If I let little squabbles get in the way of me and my, my life and with God, with, with doing what God wants me to do with my purpose, I, I'm throwing something really valuable away. And another example is in Isaiah 58, 6, and this is the forgotten people. Um, is this not the fast which I choose, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? See, they thought they were doing a good thing by fasting from food. That means giving up food for a, a, a time of, of prayer. And, and God said, hold up. Let me holler at you, okay? Uh, I don't actually want you to do this. 
Okay, I, I actually want you to show love to people. Oh, well, hold on. God, hold on. I'm doing all the right things. Ah, but you lack love. See, that's, that's, that's the real key there. How I treat people shows my relationship with God. And the fourth thing in, this, um, in, in my relationship with God here, how I listen to God, how I manage things, how I treat people, the fourth thing, how I handle problems or conflicts. It, it, normally, when problems come by, this is our instant reaction. I want this to end as quickly as possible. This is an intrusion on my life. It's keeping me. It's keeping me from God. It's keeping me from ministry. It's keeping me from reaching out to people. It's keeping me from living. But I would challenge that view. I am convinced that every problem is not a problem in and of itself. It is an appointment from God. An opportunity for you to reach into the heart of someone else that you otherwise would not have. Now, what do you mean? Well, let me give you a few examples from the real world. I'm not going to use, you know, fantasy. We're going to talk real world here for just a minute, okay? I know the real world is kind of boring. I'd rather be in Narnia myself, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> there was a woman that I knew who had, who got cancer. And terrible. Cancer is terrible. But yet, God was able to use her in that time of having cancer to reach other people in cancer and spread the message of Jesus to give people hope. A door that would have been closed. So was, is cancer a terrible thing in and of itself? Yes. Death is a terrible thing, but death comes for us all either way. But in her sickness, she was able to reach people. So yes, death is a terrible thing, cancer is a terrible thing. But it served a purpose, and her life had purpose beyond the cancer. What we do is we think that if we have a situation that, that just seems insurmountable, that means I have no purpose until I can overcome it. That's not, that's not how it works. Every single problem we face is an appointment from God. As an example, there was this guy who gets sold as a slave by his brothers. They hate him. Living around people that, that you hate is hard enough. But they hated him so much that they sold him as a slave. He gets sold as a slave to this guy in another country, so he's not even in his homeland anymore. And then he gets accused of sleeping with his wife's, with his boss's wife, which he didn't. And so then he gets sent to prison. So then he serves as a, as a slave in prison, or jail, I always get the two confused. And then he has a, a, a chance to get out. He says, hey, don't forget about me, don't you? Forget about me. <laughs> but they do anyways. And so he gets left in prison for even longer. I mean, this is literally the, the worst thing that could happen. Jeez, God, did you forget about me down here? And so then what happens is one day he's just minding his own business, and the Pharaoh's like, hey, I had this dream. And this guy's like, oh, yeah, I know a guy. And so this guy gets brought out of prison, and this is what he says at the end of all these bad things happening. But Joseph, that's the name of the guy who all those bad stuff happened to, said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? Ooh. Now there's the first problem that we have with power struggles. We try to put ourselves in God's place. Ah. So first, he had, a, he had, the, he had the situation in proper perspective. He realized that he was not in the place of God. Ah. That's usually where, where we misstep. So then, having that figured out, he's able to say the next part. As for you, you meant evil against me. You tried to do something bad, selling me into slavery. That was bad. I am your brother, after all. Not a good idea to sell me into slavery anyways. But if you were, it's kind of heartless that, you know, you're my brother. Uh, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You see what he just said? He just said, my problem was an appointment from God. When problems come by, we don't have to look at them with dread. When poor health comes by, we don't have to look at it with dread. It's not the end of the story. It's the end of the story when you're in heaven, and that doesn't sound like such a bad ending. I mean, Paul even puts it like this. I don't even think that the, 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 these, little, these little tribals that we're dealing with here on earth are even worth mentioning with what, in the same sentence of what we're going to be dealing with in heaven. It's completely not even in the same ballpark. 
And I, there's, I think there's just a lot of hope there. So those four things show my relationship with God. I'll go back to them. How I listen to God, so that's obeying Him, doing what He told me to do. How I manage things, that's, that's you know, all my thing, uh, the different things like money and time and how I use it and invest it. Uh, how I treat people, which is measured by how I treat my enemies, not by how I treat my friends. Anybody can treat somebody that they like nice. Anybody can do that. That's not that big of a thing. How you treat your enemies, that's, that's different. And then how I handle problems. These are the four areas that show my relationship with God. Okay, so what do I control? We looked at my relationship with God. Okay, everybody's clear on that? Okay, now the second thing that we control, my grip. Have you ever tried to get, you know, and I will say that, oh, well, yeah. Have you ever tried to get a cat out of a trap? They do this thing with their claws where they dig it into the sides and you're all just, I'm trying to free you, why won't you let me help you? You know, but they just sit there and fight you and then they scream about it the whole time. And then they start clawing you to death like you're trying to eat them. It's like, look, if I was going to eat, eat anything, I wouldn't eat you, you're not even cooked. Come on. Uh, you know, it's, but that's kind of how we address a lot of our situations. We, we look at life a lot like this. I've got to hold on to it as hard as I can because somebody might try and take it away. It, it, it's not going to be very happy in life if you go through life trying to grab onto as much as you can. Okay, so let's, let's look at a few things. First off, my maturity, how, how, how grown up I am, is shown by how I act on a bad day when I don't have it all together. If you've gotten enough sleep, you don't have any problems, hey, it is easy. It is easy to take care of stuff. You go to the DMV, they take forever, you're like, I don't care, take your time. I'm all good. But now, now let's add some, let's add some pain. Yep. Anybody who's over 25, you slept wrong, you have back pain. Okay, all right. Let, let's add some back pain. Let's add uh, two hours of sleep so you're groggy. Uh, then let's add some more stuff. Uh, I don't know, you guys have kids. Your kids called you and said something real stupid just to annoy you. Say, oh, if you were still in my house, I'd give you the whooping. But you're 30 now and I can't spank you, but oh. How about you move back in with me, buddy? Uh, you know, and, and, and so, okay, now you're running late because you overslept because you couldn't get to sleep, and now you have only have two hours of sleep, remember? And so then you go down to the DMV, and you're supposed to ha you have a meeting literally in five minutes. So you walk to the DMV, and they say, there's going to be about a 35-minute wait. And you're like, okay, where's your manager? I talk to your manager. That's about how it goes. So, my grip. A lot of times, it sounds so innocent. I don't really have a, have a, have a, have a problem with holding on to stuff. I really don't. Um, it's just that if I would have done this thing differently, okay, let's look at that. There's a story about this guy named Job. He's, he's, he's really got it going on, man. He's just, they say he's above reproach. He's got his act together, man. Have you ever seen one of those people you think, I, I, I hope one day to be as good as them? That's Job. He's the envy of everybody. And this is what it says. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send, his kids used to have a feast and they would switch where they were having the feast at. Okay? And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them when the days of feasting had completed their cycle. Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Now, hear me on this. You don't know how many times I hear parents say, if I would have done something different, my kids would have turned out differently. Mm -hmm. Job did everything right. And not only did every single one of his kids die, but he had a bunch of problems that happened, and it was not his fault. This is what I'm getting at. There are some of you who are sitting here saying, man, I really messed up with my kids. Let it go. I really feel like there's somebody here specifically who I'm supposed to tell you whatever you would have done differently wouldn't have changed anything. I don't know who that's for, but I am 100% positive that that's for somebody. So 
deposited, that's in your bank account now. Remember to review it in case you start having another guilt trip later on. Anyways, okay, so we're talking about my grip. The other thing that I can control here, if I would have just, no. Not only really that, but even if you, you doing something else would have changed something, you can't. Time is like a river. Once the water's gone, you can't get it to come back and repeat the process over again. There's a song by a band named Thrice. It's called A Branch in the River. And, uh, whoops, I guess I, I got rid of the, they're suppo it's supposed to say right here, A Branch in the River by Thrice. I, uh, I guess I cut it off there. Much like I cut off verse 8 this morning. <laughs> uh, anyways, it says this, holding on to a branch in the river, so scared of letting go, praying only that someone would stop the flow. And I feel like a lot of times we approach life with that. We, we just want to hold on for all this worse, but it's just not going to happen. I think that this can be summarized very nicely by the serenity prayer, if you guys don't know it. Oh, there it is! <laughs> uh, God granted me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, that is just a good prayer. Yeah. Throughout the next four, four weeks that we're looking at, or I guess the next three weeks, because it's a four-parter, throughout the next three weeks, I would be just delighted, I would be tickled pink, if you guys would make this your part of your prayer, don't pray more than just this, but include this in your prayer for the next three, three weeks until it really starts to get in here. And then pray it for a little bit longer because this is just a good thing to remember and it really summarizes what we're looking at here. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That's about 90% of the things in your life. But two other things that I, I, I want to kind of tell you about what you can loosen your grip on. Failed expectations, we all have them. Maybe God let you down. You thought he was going to act in a certain way and he didn't. Maybe you were betrayed by someone who you thought was real close, even family sometimes. Uh, maybe, maybe you had a personal failure. Now to me, those are some of the hardest things. When you have a personal failure, and it seems like, how can I get over this because I messed up? Maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's what it is. It's some kind of a failed expectation. Maybe it's titles and accomplishment. You were hoping to really be someone and you don't think that you are. Maybe it's something else. Maybe, maybe it's a dream that you had that you feel like it's died, been run over by a truck, um, been scraped up by the road crew, thrown into a pile of rocks, and then fell off a ledge and now it's lost at sea somewhere. I mean, it's just the dream's dead, it's gone. It's, 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 it's over. I don't know what it, whatever it is, but failed expectations. You have to loosen your grip. And the second thing of all these things about loosening your grip that I, I really have to mention is hopeless situations. Maybe it's the death of a loved one. Maybe you weren't ready for them to go, but guess what they did? That's hard. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. But holding on to them isn't going to change anything. They're still dead. Now, the quicker you come to terms with that, the quicker you can move on. Life shouldn't end because someone you loved, their life ended. Maybe, maybe your hopeless situation is something else. Maybe it's an addiction. You really have to learn with addiction. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying you shouldn't get help. I'm not saying that at all. But no man is an island. You cannot beat addiction by yourself, and you cannot do it without God, and it will not have a lasting impact. Even if you do get over addiction, what I've seen normally is people substitute addition, addictions. Yes. If they have, like, I don't know, math, they switch it for now they overeat, now they steal, now they have a problem with their money. See what I mean? So now they, they still don't have a stable life. Now, although it is good that they're off of meth, hey, that's good, but it's not good what they've substituted because the addictive behavior hasn't been dealt with. Do you, you get what kind of done with there? There really has to be something that goes into that vacuum. Anyways, maybe it's world news. You know, watching the news and getting all and getting all bent out of shape is not going to fix the problem. Okay. Maybe you have a problem with President Trump. Maybe you don't. Maybe you have a problem with the economy. Maybe you don't. Maybe you have a problem with global warming. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Whatever it is. But when you watch the news, they get you all riled up about situations that you actually can't really change. So you can live your life on edge 
worrying about everything else, or you can just let it go. Really, it's up to you. I'm not saying if you if you if you have the power to change something, by all means, go ahead. That takes us to the to the first point. But in this point, there's a lot of things that you just need to let go. So here's a list of things that you do not control. Okay, so my relationship with God, my grip. Those are the things you do control. Here's a list of things you do not control. Your spouse's character. You don't know how many people I see get married and think that they can change your spouse. You can't. Let it go. You lost that war. Let it go. The longer you, the longer you try and fight it, the longer you're going to be miserable. Just accept them for who they are and move on. If you don't like who they are, well, you probably shouldn't marry them. I mean, I, I'm married here, guys. I know what it's like. You have to stop comparing your spouse to everyone else. The, the grass is always green on the other side. Learn to love what you got. Amen. It's that simple. Or you can go for on a fool's errand trying to find someone better and have fun with that, ruining your life. You know, your kids will lose all respect for you, too. So you can't change your spouse's character, but you can love and encourage your spouse. You can't change your children's decisions. Now, I hear this a lot. Control your kids. You can't control your kids. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You cannot control kids because the decision is still theirs. See what I mean? Control freaks, freaks have a really hard time with this. They, they want to think that they're always in power of their kids. I could make them do it. And I could often, I'd go up and blow their house down, and then they'll listen to me. It's like, well, you, that's going to come out with, oh, I'll get back to that, but yeah, I'll come back to that. When you have a teenage son, for instance, this is a great example, it's going to end in, in one of two ways. Number one, you're either going to break them, which will ruin them for the rest of their life. You'll win the war, but you'll break them. Or, well, well let me come back to that. So you can't make your, your children's decisions for them. However, you can show them. You can show them. You can parent them. You can set limits, you can get them in trouble and discipline them, all good things, but at the end of the day, you cannot make their decisions for them. They are their own person. And they will make their own decisions, like it or not. Now, you can get stuck in a power struggle with them, or you can focus them in the right area. Choice is up to you. Um, another thing, uh, sometimes it's <laughs> we cannot control our boss. I can do my best at work, and they still might, might not like me, but I can't control my boss. My enemies. <laughs> this is what you do when you have an enemy. First off, you try and make peace with them. If that doesn't work, you try and make peace with others. If that doesn't work, you just keep them at a distance and you keep living your life. And you keep doing the right thing and you keep being a good person. And if that doesn't work and they're still talking about you, <laughs> then you prevent bad attitudes and words in the face of ongoing struggle. You keep your mouth shut and you keep your mind clear. Okay? <laughs> Another thing you cannot control, conflicts. You can drop it, but you can't control it. Conflicts will come. It's a part of life. You know, I, some people think that ministry is all problems. Well, of course it is, because you're dealing with people. And people have a bunch of problems. We have problems. We're people. It happens in life. If you if you run from ministry because you're afraid to face problems, then you might as well just go ahead and kill yourself. Because well, don't 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 do that. That's just, that, I shouldn't say that, especially with how how many people commit suicide. I shouldn't have said that. Um, you should probably just go ahead and hide in a cave. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, okay. Another thing that I cannot change: God. Ooh. I can pray, but I can't change God. When I try to control things, when I try to control these things, I start losing, I start a losing power struggle. <laughs> oh boy. When you try to control something that you can't, you are literally starting a war that you cannot win. It is a losing battle. And anybody remember Vietnam? <laughs> kind of like that. Okay, so, one more thing I want. Okay, and going back to the teenage son before we close out here. Um, if you have a, ten a teenage son, you will either make him into an adversary where he feels like he has to fight you to prove himself, or you will break him. 
Because what's happening is he's becoming a person. He's learning his independence. He's finding his place in the world. And this is going to have some conflict. You're going to do things that you don't like. Did you know that your kids are going to do things you don't like? Did you know that? Now, as control freaks, we have a real big problem with that. Because we like to pretend in this fantasy world that we can have perfect kids by just being a good enough parent. And they'll make all the right calls, and they'll make Daddy proud. And that's not how it's really going to work, though. Either, either you're going to have an adversary where your fit, kid feels like he has to constantly validate himself and fight you on everything, or you're going to break him. And then he won't win. You don't want to break your kids and break their spirits in order to get them to do something that you want because you're a control freak. Just let go. Honestly, parent, and then let them make their own decisions. That's hard, guys, but it, it, it's what's necessary. And I think that's a really good example for this whole thing. We try and hold on to a power struggle that doesn't exist. We try to hold on to something that we don't have control of. And I think that's just a great example of what we're talking about here. Can you make somebody else's decisions for them? No. So okay, let, let's see how this applies in a, in a bigger arena. I talked about a teenage son. Let's talk about a bigger arena. Maybe you have a really annoying boss. You can't make their decisions for them either. Let's say you have you are in a conflict with somebody and you, nothing you seem to do is right. You can't make their decisions for them. It's the same principle. In life, you are responsible for two things. Your relationship with God, as shown in your relationship to others and those kinds of things, and your grip on the situation. Let go of the branch in the river. Let it go. Okay. Which takes us to our application. The, the last thing that I want to get across here. God is really leading you down a river. Your life is a river. And you do not know what's ahead. You don't. You don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know what kind of problems you're going to face tomorrow. You don't know. You're going heading down a river with no map. Okay? Now, with that being said, let go of what you can not and should not control. For control freaks, man, that's like, ooh, that's like getting shot. You mean let go? <laughs> no, I'm not letting go. Yeah, well, okay. We are here as a church to build bridges and restore people to God. When you learn how to let go, and you have such peace, guys, you will have so much peace. Other people are going to see it when they're in their problems because you're going to display it while you're in your problems. So do what you can with what you have. If you have finances, use your finances. If you if you are good at physical labor, use your physical labor. If you're good at leadership, then lead. But whatever it is, lead. And then let go of everyone and everything else. Just let it go. You're not in control. That's all right. This is one of the first things I always tell people when they're having anxiety and panic attacks. Let it go. You're not in control. Just let it happen. Let the panic attack run its course. And after it's gone and washed over you, you'll be fine. Just let it go. What happens with people, they're real high strung and then they have a panic attack and they try to hold on to control and they're not in control. And so what then, what a lot of counselors will tell you is, do something that helps you to feel like you're in control. That's a terrible idea. This is a way better solution. Learn that you aren't in control. And it's a lot it's a lot easier to deal with. And with all those things being said, I'm going to leave you with a quote by Maya Angelou. Do the best you can until you know better. Then, when you know better, do better. If you'll join me in prayer, we're not going to pray for the food in here. Um, Joe's going to pray for the food in, in there when you guys are done praying. But if you'll just, uh, just join me in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to learn how to let go and uh, to not feel like we always have to you know, control everything and micromanage everything and tell you how to do your job and tell everybody else how to do your job and to help us just learn to let go and to help us to seek uh, our relationship with you more than what we're wanting um, other people to do and help us to uh, help us to learn how to be happy without being in control and as we deal with these power struggles in us God, I just pray that you'd help us to, to, to have a patient, a patient spirit, that we would be able to, to shift through these different things that we're feeling.
and uh, you'd help us to, uh, to move forward. I really just want you to take a moment, and I want you to just really search through, search through your heart, just for a minute, okay? We're not gonna we're not gonna go to prayer and everything. If you want to pray, go ahead. But I just want you to take this real quick minute, and I want you to I want you to look at your life, and I want you to say, what am I struggling for control of that I should be letting go? Maybe you're maybe you've been trying to micromanage your spouse and get them to think and act and do like you do. Maybe you're maybe you're trying to still assert control over your 30 year old child. You know maybe. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. Just just think about it. And uh, say, just this really, really quick prayer with me. God, please help me to see an area in my life that I need to let go of control. Help me to see an area in my life that I need to just let go of control. And uh, j just spend a few minutes with that. Whenever you're done, you can go into the dining hall.